Hey there, it's Dr. Justin. Evan, how are we doing today, man? Hey, happy Monday. I almost thought, what day is it? But it's Monday, so happy Monday to you. I know, it's Monday already, and the kiddo's coming in three weeks. Can't oh believe God. that. Really excited. Uh, you know, it's like uh, I'm cautiously optimistic, you know? I'm just like, it's going to be great, but then, oh, sleepless nights, and, you know, just trying to get used to that, not having... <laughs> Uh, having an extra person in the household, you know, those stressors that come with it, good and bad, but on the overall, really, really excited and stoked. Good, man. Good. Yeah. I mean, even for us with the one-year-old, you know, sleep can still be, can still be troublesome some nights, especially once the teeth start coming in. So we're, we're hanging in there. We're taking the yeah. adaptogen. So yeah, that's good. It. And your wife's staying at home too. So she's able to have a little bit extra time to allocate to that too, right? Exactly. Yeah, same my wife. So that's a, a good plus, good check in the positive column. So we're really happy about that. Totally, totally. Well, good. So we're, we're going to chat about toenail fungus today, and I'm sure we'll um, branch off into some other topics. But many people have this issue, and many people have this issue chronically. They'll go to their doctors or their podiatrist or wherever, and they don't really get good results. And sometimes they have to get on prescription drugs like prescription antifungal drugs, or they're trying the Lamisil and all these other conventional alternatives that you've seen commercials for. And once again, we think there's superior alternatives and superior solutions that we want to discuss with our audience today. Absolutely. And again, with uh, toenail fungus, I'm actually dealing with toenail fungus again. Last time I had it was eight years ago. Now, my gut's doing pretty good. Um, again, I keep carbohydrates and refined sugar down pretty well. I do have some fermented foods every single day, but I keep the refined sugar and alcohol down. So last time I had a little toenail fungus was about eight years ago. I treated it naturally with oil, topical oil of oregano, and now it's just coming back. And I've just started applying some um, emulsified oil of oregano. And again, in my line, we use the GI Clear 5. And I'll be combining that with my herbal nail fungus soak from Long Creek Herbs. So we'll be doing that as well. And I'll have it gone another week or two. Typically what you see is like within two weeks, you start to see fresh growth coming out of the bottom of the nail. The nail that's already been kind of disfigured with that, you know, slightly thickened yellowy hue kind of nail, kind of callus that forms on top of the nail, that's gone. You, you're not going to be able to reverse that. It'll just grow out nice and fresh. So I'm doing some of the topical oil of oregano and I'm doing the soak as well. I'll be starting the soak this week, but I have it all ready to go. I got the apple cider vinegar for it, the one without the mother. You want the cheaper version and then we'll mix it in there and I'll do a five minute soak every night. But again, I haven't had it for eight years. It slid back in. Um, and again, my gut's doing really good. I'm taking some probiotics right now. I'm doing a lot of Saccharomyces boulardii, the Saccharophora, hitting that up hard. I feel like my gut's doing well. I'm going to do a stool test for the summer just to kind of see where I'm at and just make sure I'm on top of it. But sometimes toenail fungus can come back for many reasons, right? We walk, I'm in, I'm in sandals all day. All right. So I, I'm not wearing socks. So there's a potential, maybe there's some stuff brewing there. I'm walking 10 miles a day on my treadmill. Maybe there's a little bit of sweating happening in my sandals. Maybe I got to disinfect my sandals a few times a week, right? Cause I'm not <laughs> wearing socks on it. So that probably would be the, the reason that mine happen because I feel like my gut's doing pretty good. Digestion's good. Regularity's good. I'm never bloated or gassy. So again, we just want to fix what we find. Any thoughts, Evan? Yeah. So let's, let's chat about other things that could be going on like internally yeah. with people. So you mentioned your diet's dialed in. A lot of people, they're still getting a lot of sugars though. Even if you're eating a good, clean, organic diet, you could still get exposed to a lot of sugar. So if you're doing like a, a brand of kombucha, for example, like I won't uh, name drop, but there's a few. Oh, I'll, uh, I'll name drop. You got Go Cosmic, uh, Buddha's Brew. Uh, those are some big ones. My favorite ones, I'll tell you. Let's put the focus on the positive. Okay. I like Kavita and GT Dave's. Those yeah, are my GT favorites. Dave's is great. Yeah, especially the ginger or like the Synergy. Those are like two grams of sugar per eight ounces. Or the Kavita is even a little bit less because they use a tiny bit of stevia in there. And they use a, a, a bacillus and a plantaris strain where the GT Dave's are using a Saccharomyces strain. Ah, yeah. yeah. Welcome, Samuel. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the kombuchas, the reason I bring that up is because people just get crazy with them. Like, I've seen a lady before who was drinking like five kombuchas a day and probably the very high sugar brand. So who knows? It could have been like 100 grams of sugar per day, which 
that's going to be feeding a candida overgrowth. So even if your diet's dialed in, yeah, eat organic meats and veggies, but you drink tons of sugar in the form of a kombucha, I mean, you're really going to offset that. We've also got infections too. So if you've been on rounds of antibiotics, if you've got some type of yeast or fungus that's growing up in your gut after the round of antibiotics, if you didn't do probiotics at the same time, or if you did it to the right dosage, or maybe you went to Whole Foods and got a consumer grade product as opposed to buying a professional product like Justin's or mine, you know, we use a much higher grade formulas. And so even if you said, oh, I took antibiotics, but I did probiotics, if you just went and bought it at Whole Foods, it might not have been high enough quality to protect you. And you could still have some residual yeast and fungus in the gut. And you can test for this stuff, right? So like we'll run a stool test, like you mentioned, you're going to do one on your own. Even the organic acids too, we can see fungal markers, we can see yeast markers, bacterial overgrowth, all sorts of Absolutely. stuff that's wrong. So if it's there, you know, our philosophy is test, don't guess. And so you can spend money on conventional over-the-counter treatments. You and I will chat about some, um, you know, kind of a natural treatments as well, but it, we may have to take this battle to the, to the gut. Yeah, and then anytime we see toenail fungus, it, it could be two major things. It can be a compromised immune system kind of thing because the gut's been overrun with candida. Maybe that candida has even gone more on the systemic side, right? Or it could just be kind of a topical thing, kind of maybe you know a locker room kind of effect where you're walking around with a locker in a locker room without sandals on or something. Or maybe my thing where I'm getting maybe a little too much sweat in my sandals, and maybe that's creating a a breeding ground for for mold or yeast. So again you know, sanitation, things like that are going to be on the helpful side. So I'm trying to like get my sandals washed a few times a week and some good essential oils to kill stuff. So I'm doing that. And then obviously sometimes the infections have to get treated topically specific on that area because you treat the gut, but it's got to make its way a long way to the extremities to really get worked out. So that's a lot of um, basically lymphatic and blood flow that has to make its way there. And the question is, will the potency be there when it makes it to the end, end stage there? So that's where the topical piece is really important. Now, again, let's talk about the three ways you can test for it. So number one, you can do a gut test, but that a lot of times we'll just look at the gut candida, like in a stool test that we may do. We may look right. at yeast, we may look at candida, microsporidium yeast, we may look at um, rhodotrola candida, we may look at um, got geotrichum on there. Yep, yep, exactly. So these are all types of yeast. And again, fungus is kind of like the big umbrella and under that fungus umbrella will be different yeast. And candida is a type of yeast. So just kind of keep that in mind. So we have like the stool test looking at candida. We have candida that's kind of be a test that's more systemic such as diarabinose. Diarabinose will be a test or diarabinotic in the GPL test, right? The Great Plains lab test, but typically diarabinose will be an organic acid marker for candida. And that's going to be more of a systemic marker. It's making its way out the urine. So it tends to mean that maybe the fungus is more systemic. And for the fungus to be in the toenail, unless it's a topical thing, right, then it's probably a more of a systemic issue. So diarabinose is important. And we see some people that have diarabinose, but don't have it in the gut. And we see people that have it in the gut, but don't have it with the diarabinose. So sometimes with the organic acid test, it may correlate, but sometimes it won't because the diarabinose is more of a systemic marker. And then we have the blood test markers for candida. We have candida antibodies, IgG, IgA, IgM. And again, G is more of a long-term kind of antibody marker and IgA and IgM more of a short-term type of antibiotic marker. So we an antibody marker. So IgA, IgG, IgM, and ideally if IgA and M are high, it's typically a more acute issue with the candida and your immune system is trying to attack it and it means it's more systemic. Got it. So I had yeast overgrowth when I got my stool test run a couple years ago. It was back when I had bacterial infections too though. I had massive candida. Luckily, my nails weren't affected. I did have those vertical ridges. And then also we had a question too from Joseph. He said, um, white dots on skin. He said, is that caused by fungus in the gut? I mean, that's kind of a vague question, but Justin, what's your initial take? Yeah, I would say that sounds like tinea versicolor. Again, you can go into Google image. I'm going to do it right now. You put in tinea versicolor. You just have to know you're going to get the most severe form of it on, um, on Google image. So maybe you want, I'm going to type in mild, mild, tinea versicolor because you'll get the most extreme thing where people's skins like peeling off. But if you look on it, you're going to see some of those white dots or kind of like reddish dots. It's pretty clear on there. I got a couple right now. Yep. 
So that's more than likely what it is. That's a tinea versicolor. And there's some good soaps that you can do. I mean, you can do oil of oregano. So I will take some of my GI Clear 5 and mix it in with a little bit of MCT. A couple of drops of the GI Clear 5 and a little bit of MCT so it won't burn. And you can rub it in topically. Or there's some really good antifungal soaps that you can do. And I have a couple on my Amazon page. Uh, one's by a company called Purely Northwest. And one's by a company called ART Art Naturals. But if you go to justinhealth.com slash shop and click on Justin Health approved products and then click on the Amazon link, you'll have, see them in there. So I've used those over the years and I found them to be very successful. Perfect. Perfect. Good. Um, so we chatted about the testing. You mentioned the Arabinose. There's tartaric acid on the oat test that we'll see too. Yep. And you talked about oregano. Topically, oregano can be used internally too. So we'll use oregano with like a micro emulsified olive oil which is yep. super high quality, super gentle. And um, we chatted about diet, low sugar. Is there another angle we haven't hit that we should hit? Yeah, so there's a couple of schools of thought. So number one, you know, lower sugar, sugar, especially carbohydrates, high carbohydrates that can break down into sugar. Because people think like, well, I'm eating whole foods and they're you know, high in carbs, but there's no refined sugar, right? When you look on the label and you don't see any added sugar, they think it's okay. Right. But there may be a lot of carbohydrate in there that breaks down the sugar in the body. So you have to look at the end byproduct being sugar, not necessarily there being refined sugar. Of course, refined sugar is an issue, but sometimes the carbohydrate threshold may be a little too high and that may cause a conversion to sugar. So keeping the carbs below 50 to 75 grams, I think is a pretty good rule of thumb. And when you start the killing, actually ramping some of the carbs up just a little bit because that can draw them out and create kind of a, a, chum, a chumming-like effect, like you're going to see great white sharks and go cage diving, right? It's pretty lonely to go cage diving if there are no sharks there, but if you chum the water, you can get them to come to the surface. It's kind of like that with the candida. You can get them to come to the surface. Yep, well said. Um, we had a question from Samuel about sunscreen. So he said he knows that uh, our guest Jack Cruz doesn't advise, but can that be damaging any brands that you recommend? Uh, I've personally not used sunscreen at all this year. I've just been really smart about exposure, and I have a really cool straw hat that I wear that protects my head and my neck. I'll show it I to you. It. You're going farmer style. I love it, dude. It's so comfortable. It's actually a fishing hat. Um, so it's cool to wear out on the boat because it gives a lot of coverage. But I've just been gradually increasing exposure. And then my wife and I take a few walks per day out in the sun where we'll get maybe 10 or 15 minutes and I go without a shirt. And I've not burned, but yet I'm still getting some good color and hopefully optimizing vitamin D. So I personally rarely use sunscreen unless I'm just like going to be in a situation like I'm going to Florida and I'm going to be on the beach in Florida getting roasted, then I'd probably use it. And I use the Badger. I use the, I think it's just the Badger regular sunscreen. It's the zinc oxide by itself with like sunflower seed oil. And it smells really good, but the zinc works and it's no chemicals. Yeah, absolutely. And I disagree with Jack on, on the sunscreen thing. I think he's incorrect on that. I think um, don't use sunscreen. Get your minimal urethemal dose, MED. That's kind of where your skin gets a little bit pink. And again, for different people, that's going to be different things. Like for an African-American individual, that may be eight to 10 hours out in the sun, virtually, you know, maybe impossible to get unless it's like heart of the summer and you're in a low uh, latitude area, like maybe Austin or San Diego or Florida or something. Uh, for someone like me and you, Evan, that may be in the hot sun here today, 30 minutes, 15 minutes, right? Yeah. So get that minimal urethemal dose and then get the hat on or then get some of the sunscreen on because you don't want to burn, right? The UVA and B exposure, once you've reached that minimal urethemal dose, is you're destroying collagen, you're destroying your skin, you're creating oxidative stress. There's no reason to do that. Now, the more melanin you have throughout that tan or as Jack calls it a solar callus, that solar callus will is partly there because of melanin and melanin's natural sunblock. That's why an African American individual, right, they have more melanin. That means more natural sunblock, right? Because of where they evolve climate wise over thousands of years. And like let's say someone like me or you, probably a European, maybe middle to northern climate. So less um, pigment in the skin. So you have less natural sunblock. So you get that minimal urethemal dose and then you cover up, get a hat on and you get some natural sunscreen. And I recommend skindeep.org, skindeep.org. And they have some great recommendations. Again, I like the Marie Veronique. Marie Veronique is great. I love her sunscreen for the face, all food base, really high quality, lowest ratings on skindeep. Another brand called Michelle, 
M Y C H E L L E is phenomenal. Uh, Kiss My Face has a decent one. There's a few other uh, sunscreens that I'll report back that I use. I'm on the boat a lot. So I have some, I like the nice spray sunscreens that spray pretty thin and don't make you look like Casper the Ghost. Right. Problem with Badger, Badger makes you look like Casper the Ghost. Yeah, it does. Uh, it's, it's pretty bad. Um, but it's it's good, good ingredients, but um, there are some other ones that are a little better. The, the Michelle one um, really like blends in just beautiful. It's one other spray one that I'll find here in one second as I, I'll pull it up. But anything you want to say there, Evan? Yeah, so I mean about sunburns, I mean my grandfather, he's been dealing with – various cases of skin cancers and he used to get burned all the time he'd go to florida and get burned and now he actually had a melanoma on his arm and melanoma that can kill your ass so yeah. luckily he found it early and it was the lowest level so it actually hadn't penetrated so he's okay didn't affect the lymph or anything and he got it cut out so for me with a history of irish descent super fair skin i mean i can brown but to, to, to be susceptible and to see him deal with all the skin cancer you have surgeries. To work up to build a base first. Right. It, it's it's not fun um, to, to see him have his arm cut open and, and walk around with a bunch of stitches in his arm to get these cancers cut out. So I also think I like the idea of, oh, our ancestors didn't have sunscreen and such, but also our ancestors didn't have damage to the ozone layer, right? With all the hydrofluorocarbons and CFCs and all this stuff that's damaged the ozone layer, we're getting probably more, arguably more um, UV radiation exposure than we would have in prehistoric times because the ozone layer is so damaged. So to me, it's like it's not a pristine solar environment anymore. So I think the game has changed. Yeah, I mean, but the, you know, our ancestors still had things like clothes, right? I mean, you know, they had yeah. hats and they had longer sleeve types of uh, of items. Plus, you know, they'd build up a, a solar callus, right? It's you build up that solar callus, you may be able to stay out there much, much longer. And True. you know, frankly ancestors our ancestors didn't have the the ability to to move around uh on the latitude levels as much as we do where you know let's say you were irish descent european descent at a maybe a 38 to 42 on the latitude well that's a lot different now that you're living maybe at 35 or 32 right, right. so we're moving around a lot more so there's the clothes aspect just using uh some gentle clothes to cover things up uh, but also just building up that solar callus is very helpful and you can just do it by adding a few minutes on each day and not burning i think is good and just choosing a healthy sunscreen that's going to provide a lot of n nourishment to the skin antioxidants but not any toxins either good did you find those brands what were you going to tell us yeah the other one that i like is goddess garden it is excellent goddess garden is great and we'll try to put amazon affiliate links below so if you guys like this information you can support us at our amazon affiliate stores Perfect. Yeah, they give uh, like a couple pennies on the dollars, so it doesn't cost you extra to look at these products that Justin will link up. You could buy them directly. Yeah, these are things that I've used personally and uh, believe in. So Goddess Garden, they have a sport one too. I like it because it's the spray. So I'm out in the boat and I get my shirt off. I can just go shh, shh, and it's done. I've seen that. Pretty one. easy. Yeah, I so like it those. Works. Yep. Before, and what are like, you using? Uh, are you using like a 30, a 50? What's kind of your approach to that? 30, I mean, it, the SPF thing is kind of, um, it's interesting, right? Because once you get to a, a SPF 30, SPF stands for sun protection factor. So once you get to a 30, you're already at a 95% reduction. Now, once you go from like 30 to 60, people would think, well, it's double the protection. Well, you can't really get double when you're already at 95, right? You can't go from 95 to 190. So it ends up going like from 95 to like 98, right? So it's, you get a small minuscule uh, percent more. So in my opinion, you get the 30 and you just reapply every hour and a half to two hours. Okay. Okay, good. Um, back to the fungal piece, um, Mercola had an article about fungus and he had mentioned that him just walking outside and getting lots of sun exposure so that UV exposure helped his toenail fungus. And like you and I were chatting about, that's awesome. That's a good strategy. Try to get the sun on your skin, right? It can help with, I've seen eczema get better with skin exposure. So maybe toenail fungus could get better with sun exposure too, but the topical stuff's great. So definitely go for like the oregano oil, definitely go internal, get your gut checked out, make sure there's no yeast overgrowth and you should be in a good place. You should be able to reverse this. Yeah, absolutely. So regarding that, I think it's going to be slower doing it that way. There are some places, some, um, I want to say, periodontists, uh, podiatrists and podiatrists, they have the, the laser thing and you put your toenails under and that can help kill the, the you know, kill the fungus and wow. the toenails. Dermatologists do that too. I've seen the lasers kind of iffy, 
right? I mean, there's natural um, compounds that I mentioned. I like the emulsified oil of oregano. Mine with the GI Clear 5 is a 75% carbacol extract. That's the active constituent. That's very powerful. A lot aren't that, many of them that are out there in the market aren't as powerful as that. So I'm a big fan of that. Also, Vicks Vapor Rub has been around for a while as a natural cure for toenail fungus. So Vicks Vapor Rub is great. I always just say treat it, but then you know make sure the gut's in good place. I'm still even treating the gut right now as well. I'm taking some internally and I'm doing my GI Clear uh, 6 and 1 along with it just to make sure I'm getting my gut really cleaned out as well, just so I hit it from both ends. You kind of sandwich it. You go, you attack them from above and below. Perfect. We have one um, one last question. There was one question here that was kind of off topic about berberine and thrombosis. And then there was another question here about natural treatments for warts on elbows and what's the cause. What's your take on warts? I would not consider myself a wart expert. Really? You? Yeah. Are you? Stop. Um, well, typically warts, that's going to be a viral issue, right? That's a papillomavirus. Again, there's different papillo there's different kinds of viruses that can create these type of warts. Um, some like HPV can create kind of genital or anal warts. Not so fun. There are some that other viruses that manifest. A couple things you can get the immune system strengthened. High doses of monolaurin, um, vitamin C, um, reishi mushroom, medicinal herbs can help. Uh, topically, I use a specific serum called J Bio Serum. I carry that in my online store. I like that as specific growth factors and stem cells that can attack it. I've seen some of these uh, warts go away literally in just a few weeks. So I've seen that personally. And then outside of just the conventional way of freezing it off, but you want to get the underlying immune issue under control. So the immune right. support, the monolaurin, the vitamin C, um, high dose vitamin D, you can even hit silver up as well. These are all going to be great antiviral components that will help knock it down. Yeah, I had a... I had a planter's wart on my foot when I was a kid. I was in martial arts class, and I think I picked it up just from the from the floor being dirty. Yep, yep, that can happen too. And typically, if it's like that, your body will fight it off. I had one maybe six, seven years ago. My body fought it off in a month or two. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I noticed it. I remember it getting it gone. I remember getting it scooped out. That was not fun. I had like an acid band aid, and it like burned the burned the wart and then I went to the I got I guess it was a foot doctor and they scooped out the little uh, roots of it and then it was gone I was like maybe 10 or 12 I remember how brutal wow. it felt though that foot is a sensitive area it is man absolutely uh, but Robert was asking about warts on the elbows so hopefully hopefully that helps Robert and look up earth clinic too I've not looked it up but earth clinic they've typically got some good recommendations for things you could do apple cider vinegar pops up all the time on earth clinic so maybe that's a remedy acetic acid acetic acid has a lot of antifungal effects getting your digestion better right the more food sits in your gut and ferments and rancidifies and putrefies that can put a stress on your intestinal tract for sure good good so um the the question about berberine do you feel like answering that or should we save that for another show what's your yeah so what's the question about um berberine thrombosis how does uh, does berberine increase thrombosis chances? Uh, I'm concerned about some of the rumors on that topic. I'm not sure about that. I'm I don't, not sure about thrombosis and berberines. I can pull something up here just in a, in a minute. I mean, that's going to be um, – thrombosis is going to be like clotting and clotting of the circulatory system. So will it increase clotting and obstruction of the venous flow? I would say – I would say no if we're reducing inflammation because yeah, if we can really how. reduce if we can reduce inflammation a lot of the inflammatory cytokines is what creates a lot of the clotting. So a couple things you can do to prevent that is number 1 you can do systemic based enzymes on an empty stomach if you're concerned that will help break down any of the fibrin or any uh, congested compounds in there. Number 2 you can use ginger which is a natural anticoagulant and will prevent things from sticking around. And then number three, you can also do fish oil. Fish oil will also have um, really good effects on that as well. Yeah, I'm looking up here. The only contraindications I've seen for berberine would be, it says avoided during pregnancy uh, for potential to cause uterine contractions and miscarriage, and then in jaundice neonates because of its bilirubin displacement properties. But besides that, I don't, I don't see any way that that would cause an issue. Like you yeah, said- I think I mean, I think anytime you're systemically inflamed, there's definitely a chance of 
things just flowing around very sluggishly throughout the circulatory, lymphatic, and venous system. So that makes sense. So I just think you just do things to reduce inflammation. And that's why we don't start a lot of the killing until one to two months in because we're really working on reducing a lot of the inflammation during that time. And that's part of why I build into my protocols uh, the ginger tea. The ginger tea is very profound at helping to provide that anticoagulant environment and to really reduce the inflammation and keep things flowing well. Well said. Well said. We got a uh, question from Jeanette, and then we'll answer Dennis. Uh, Jeanette says, "You mentioned upping vitamin D. Can you get too much from the sun? Probably not. You would probably never be able to get to a toxic level. No. But some governor. Wise? Yeah, there's a yeah. governor. You really won't make more than fifteen to twenty thousand IU's in the sun. So you kind of have a capacitor or a governor on that." Um, but yeah, I mean, it's fat soluble vitamin. You don't really want to go over a hundred and if you go a little too high, it's not, it's not the worst thing in the world. Just cut it out and your body will start to break it down and you'll be okay. But you know, keep it with a normal physiological levels. 50 to 70 is ideal. Maybe if you have an autoimmune condition, go to 70 to hundred and you're going to be in a pretty good place. Yeah. So just get, get tested Jeanette and make sure that they run the correct one. Some like conventional doctors, they'll run, I believe it's what one comma 25 hydroxy vitamin D and that's not the correct one. You want the 25 dash OH. You want the calcidiol. You want the calcidiol, right? Vitamin D3 goes in the blood. It goes through the liver and that spits out 25 hydroxy D3. And then that then converts that's calcidiol and then goes to the kidney and that's active vitamin D, which is calcitriol 125 hydroxy. But you really want to look at the 25. That's the better one. Okay. So it's like 25 OH and that how it will show up on a lab. Yep. Yep, 25 OH slash vitamin D or 25 okay. OH slash D. Absolutely. Cool. Dennis had a question about coffee. Is coffee okay on a gluten free diet? Justin, I believe you are a, are you a daily coffee drinker? Yeah, I enjoy coffee. I mean, I think there's a lot of research on coffee being beneficial. Just choose high quality uh, organic coffee. There's a lot of antioxidants, a lot of alkaloids that are in there. I'm more concerned about how often are you doing it? Are you doing one or two cups in the morning? Fine. I think that's okay. Are you doing it in the afternoon time? Probably not so good because the half-life of caffeine is about eight hours. So that can disrupt your cortisol rhythm. It can obstruct or obstruct uh, nighttime uh, resting and that cortisol going down when it should. Typically, if you're going to do coffee in the morning, add healthy fats in with it, MCT, grass-fed butter, or ghee if you can tolerate it. That'll time release the caffeine and create a nice little magic carpet caffeine ride. So you get this time release kind of effect, less stimulating. If you get that CYP gene, you may get very anxious afterwards because you have a hard time metabolizing it and it hangs out in your system and you feel really irritable and not so good. If you have excessive amounts of vanyl mandolate or homovanilate going on, right, that's more adrenaline, more dopamine that may create more anxiety. And if you have severe cortisol issues, you may feel worse. You know, it could be yeah. a genetic SNP issue. It could be a cortisol issue. But um, if you're doing a little bit of caffeine in the morning, right, one to two cups, and you adding some healthy fats in at the time release it, I don't have a problem with it as long as the coffee is of high, high quality. Yeah, and your cup is a real cup, not a 32-ounce giant cup. Yeah, I do like 12 to 16 ounces, but I also put about 16 grams of high-quality grass-fed collagen in there. I put about a tablespoon of grass-fed butter, and I put about a tablespoon of MCT oil. So I get about 600 calories in my coffee. I get a ton of really good fat, which time releases the caffeine, and then I get a whole bunch of you know protein and amino acids in there, and then I get some really good alkaloids and antioxidants. Perfect, perfect. Last question here, uh, Robert. Any idea why weightlifting worsens acid reflux symptoms? I mean, that sounds like a hiatal hernia, but what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I would need to know the scenario. Are we talking like you're eating within one or two hours and then you're having acid reflux because you're eating or because you're working out? Maybe you're working out, you're not giving enough time between your meals and then the exercise. So, people that have kind of a gastroparesis thing happening where their intestinal tracts releasing the food a little bit slower from the stomach into the intestines. You may need to give it an extra hour. Adding some ginger can be a nice natural prokinetic. It will help uh, stimulate that migrating motor complex to dump that food from the stomach into the small intestine so it's processing faster. If you're having that issue, um, easiest thing is just work out first thing in the morning and just have a nice clean protein shake first thing with water so you get instantaneous protein in the bloodstream within 30 minutes or work out, you know, four to five hours after a meal and then have a nice shake right before so you get those amino acids that aren't going to linger in the intestines because they're already pre-broken down. So Robert gave us a clarification. He said no eating and specifically happening with pull-up type workouts. Could be a hiatal hernia issue. I mean, you're probably activating those lats when you're pulling up yeah. and maybe that's popping the rib cage and, and 
creating some tension on that cura and it's pulling that diaphragm up or tugging that stomach. So here's your diaphragm, right? And here's your stomach, right? And it just, it pops up above it, right? So that top part of that fundus of the stomach is popping up. That um, esophageal sphincter is popping up above it where the esophagus and the stomach meet. It's just going just above. Yeah. So what would you now do? You could do this. You, you could do this thing where you have your, your, your hands up and you swallow water and then you, you drop back down on your heels while swallowing water like this. And that can help. Uh, I know it's a little funny, right? Uh, <laughs> I love I'll that. bust a move. <laughs> All right. So, um, so you can do that to help lower the esophagus, or you can go see a good chiropractor. Like when I used to do this, I would creep right up under the ribs, have the person take a deep breath in. They just thin their belly out. The intestines are moving down. The diaphragm is moving down. I get my fingers up underneath that top part of the diaphragm, and when they breathe out again, in out. I'd pull down as they would breathe out and that would just tug that um, basically that diaphragm down, allowing the stomach to come down. And you can feel it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Exactly. Cool. So Robert, hope that helps. Cool. So any other issues on the toenail side? I think we hit it all, man. I think we'll probably be repeating ourselves if we say if we keep going, but I think we did pretty good. We hit the diet front. We hit the, the testing, not guessing. We hit some of the treatment options and some of the, the supplements. So people can go to, uh, your store, justinhealth.com. Check out some of those products. Robert gave us one last note. So let's see what he said. He oh, said, just to add one thing. So when I'm yeah. up underneath that diaphragm, I'm grabbing kind of the top part of the stomach and, and I'm pulling the, the stomach down not the diaphragm down. So like if here's the diaphragm, I'm like sliding my fingers like right here and I'm pulling down here. So I'm trying to take the intestines that are up here and pull them down. That's the goal. Yeah. Good. Uh, Robert, he gave us a little bit of clarification. He said he had a GI x-ray in examination with a magnesium drink. They said no sign of a hernia. Would they even detect a hiatal hernia though with the GI x-ray? I'm not sure if they would. I'm not sure. I think you may need a barium. I think you may need a barium swallow test to detect that. Um, but in general, I would just, um, just make some of the changes that we talked about, like get the stomach acid looked at, get the infections looked at, yeah. making sure that you're digesting your food properly and, um, get the gut fixed first and then see if that goes away. Cause a lot of times inflammation screws everything up, right? You got a viscerosomatic reflex connection with the nerves and the diaphragm and the stomach affecting those nerves around it. And when there's inflammation, those nerves get tight and, um, things can contract and, and get pulled in different directions. I agree a thousand percent. Like you told me when I was having my gut issues, it was H. pylori. So he could have yeah. some type of H. pylori infection that's just creating inflammation. It might not be a physical a physical uh, injury like a hiatal hernia at all. It could just be infection related. Exactly. Totally. Cool. Cool. Is there well anything said. else you want to address, Evan? I think I'm done. I'm done. What do you got? So we hit all the toenail fungus things. It could be a systemic issue. It could be a localized issue. Okay, if it's localized, fix vapor mm -hmm. rub tea tree oil or melaleuca, oil oregano, right? You could do the um, GI Clear 5, topically hit it. You could do the nail fungus soak in my store, the, the Long Creek Herbs one. That's phenomenal with apple cider vinegar, right? That works great. Uh, the three tests that we want to do are organic acids, D-lactate. I'm sorry, I'm, um, D-rabinitol. D-lactate is another one for, fung or for bacterial issues. D-lactate, um, D-rabinose via organics, Candida antibodies, IgG, IgA, IgM, and then we can do Candida in the stool, whether it's you know the GI map or we look at a doctor's data or a 401H, we can look at Candida in the stool as well. Perfect. Does that help? That's, a, that's great. I hope it helps people. If you want to schedule consults, just go to justinhealth.com. You can check out my site, evanbrand.com. We've got hundreds. We've Justin and I, we have a, a combined total of over 300 podcasts and 300 videos at this point. So and if you guys are liking this, give us thumbs up right now. We love it. If you guys are on Facebook, give us some hearts, give us some shares. We really appreciate it. We get motivated. We want to provide more content. And sometimes we're so busy. We're just at the end of the day, we're like, we're tank, but we get those extra couple of thumbs up. We get motivated, right, Evan? Exactly. Exactly. That social, that social feedback is really helpful so give us thumbs up and uh we'll see you again if you have questions send them in just use uh one of our contact pages and send us some topic ideas if we haven't addressed your concerns yet we'll do our best to cover it love it awesome man take you care guys have a great day take care facebook and youtube